evolution. Part 1. The case for ecstasy. The alternative is unconsciousness. 1. The default setting, the rat race, the constant knowing sense of having had, and lost, some infinite thing. David Foster Wallace. Chapter 1. What is this fire? The switch? One of the hardest parts of being a Navy SEAL1 isn't knowing when to shoot. It's knowing when not to shoot. And we know why. If you put a dozen guys in a dark room and arm them with automatic weapons, somebody going to blink or twitch, then it's game on. That's what made capturing Alwazu to such a challenge. More than anything else, the SEALs needed him alive. It was late September 2004. At a forward operating base in the northeastern corner of Afghanistan, a couple of dozen members of the elite SEAL Team 6, or in their preferred parlance, DEVG or U, were stationed there, gathering intelligence and staging missions. Some six months prior, a radio operator had noticed a spike in Wazoo chatter. Perhaps he was hiding in the woods to the south of them. Possibly he was in the mountains to the north. Then the rumors turned into facts. Wazoo actually was in the woods and the mountains. Hold up in an alpine forest some 70 miles west of their current position, for the SEALs. This wasn't good news. The terrain to the west was high desert. Lonely, barren, and rough. Not enough cover for a stealth mission. Under these conditions. There was no way to get in without a firefight, no guarantee they could capture Wazoo alive, though he was once a mid-level player. Al Wazoo's notoriety had skyrocketed after he'd pulled off a feat no other Okita operative had accomplished. An escape from an American detention center, this single act elevated him to the upper echelons of the organization, earning him a band of committed followers and that ultimate jihadi honor, a personal letter of commendation from Osama bin Laden, ever since. Wazoo had been busy recruiting, raiding, and killing. That's why the SEALs needed him alive. His value as an intelligence asset had quadrupled. There was enough in his head to take down most of the remaining cells in the area. Plus, the SEALs wanted to send a message. And that day in September, they got their chance. The radio call came in the afternoon. Al Wazoo was on the move. He'd come out of the woods and down from the mountains. He was heading straight for them, for the SEALs. This changed everything, with a moving target. The variables multiplied exponentially. Anything could happen. The team got together and combed through the mission. Contingency plans were put into place. Details were committed to memory. Day turned into night and night rolled on. They only had five hours until dawn. And still no target. The SEALs needed the darkness. Their mission got much more complicated during the day. There were more people awake and more traffic on the roads into many ways a suspect could disappear into a crowd. Then, after all that waiting, they suddenly had a target. Alwazu had stopped. Only a few hours of darkness remained and the SEALs couldn't believe their luck. He'd hold up less than a mile from their current position. They could literally walk to the Opus. Commander Rich Davis wasn't sure it was luck. As the leader of this unit, he knew how badly his men wanted Alwazu. They were keyed up. A mile hike wasn't much. Davis would have preferred a three-hour uphill slog. Three hours wouldn't tire them out. But it might calm them down. Might help them focus. Might help them merge. The Greeks had a word three for this merger that Davis quite liked. Ecstasy. The act of stepping beyond oneself. Davis had his own word as well. He called it the switch. The moment they stopped being separate men with lives and wives and things that matter. The moment they became. Well, there's no easy way to explain it, but something happened out there. Plato described ecstasy as an altered state where our normal waking consciousness vanishes completely, replaced by an intense euphoria and a powerful connection to a greater intelligence. Contemporary scientists have slightly different terms and descriptions. They call the experience group flow. A peak state, explains psychologist Keith Sawyer in his book Group Genius, for a group performing at its top level of ability in situations of rapid change. It's more important than ever for a group to be able to merge action and awareness to adjust immediately by improvising, whatever the description. For the SEALs, once that switch was flipped, the experience was unmistakable. Their awareness shifted. They stopped acting like individuals. And they started operating as one, a single entity, a hive mind, in the high-stakes hot zone that is their job. This collective awareness is, as Davis says, the only way to get the job done. And isn't that peculiar? It means that on the night in question, during a critical mission to capture and not to kill, an altered state was the only thing standing between Alwazu and a preemptive double tap to the chest, as isolated individuals. With fingers on the trigger, someone was bound to twitch, but as a team, thinking and moving together, intelligence got multiplied. Fear divided. 
The whole wasn't just greater than the sum of its parts. It was smarter and braver too. So Commander Rich Davis wasn't just hoping they'd flip the switch that evening. He was banking on it, more than any other skill. He explains, SEALs rely on this merger of consciousness, being able to flip that switch. That's the real secret to being a SEAL, the high cost of ninja assassins. It costs $25,000 to turn five an average Joe into a combat-ready U.S. Marine, SEALs. Meanwhile, cost a lot more. Estimates for eight weeks six of Navy basic training, six months of underwater demolition training, six months of advanced skills training, and 18 months of pre-deployment platoon training. That is, what it takes to get a SEAL ready for combat, total out to roughly $500,000 per head, which is to say, the Navy SEALs are among the most expensive collections of warfighters ever assembled, and that's just the cost of training garden variety ninja assassins. Making it to the elite DEVG or U unit requires first rotating through several other SEAL teams, as it costs about $1 million a year 7 to keep a frogman in the field. And these rotations take a couple of years to complete. Add roughly another to $0.5 million to the tally, finally. There are additional months of hostage rescue training, which is DEVG or U specialty, at somewhere north of $250,000 per, all in, those couple dozen men under Rich Davis's command. The SEAL unit charged with capturing, not killing, Alwazu were an exceptionally well-oiled $85 million machine. So what are U.S. taxpayers getting for their money? A decent place to start is with the job description itself. Or rather, the lack of one. SEALs are multitasking multitools. As their official website aid explains, there is no typical day at the office for a Navy SEAL. SEALs constantly learn, improve and refine skills working with their teammates. Their office not only transcends the elements of sea, air and land, but also international boundaries, the extremes of geography and the spectrum of conflict. The technical term SEALs used to describe these conditions is BUCA. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Prevailing over this type of chaos requires an astounding level of cognitive dexterity. As Rich Davis explains, the most expensive part of these already expensive warfighters is the three pounds of gray matter resting inside their skulls. Of course, this isn't how we normally think of SEALs. What we know best about these special operators is how hard they train their bodies. Not their minds. Hell week. For example, the kickoff to their infamous selection process is five and a half days of non-stop physical exertion and radical sleep deprivation that routinely breaks world-class athletes. But even this crucible is more about brain than body, as SealFit founder Mark Devine 9 recently told Outside Magazine. Reigning is designed to find the few who have the mental toughness needed to become a SEAL. Grit is the term psychologists use to describe that mental toughness. A catch-all for passion, persistency, resiliency, and, to a certain extent, ability to suffer. And while this is accurate, SEALs are gritty as hell, it's only part of the picture, grit only refers to individual toughness. And the secret to becoming a SEAL has everything to do with team. At every step of the training, says Davis, from the first day of BUD, as through their last day in DEVGRU, we are weeding out candidates who cannot shift their consciousness and merge with the team. On the surface, of course, this seems ridiculous. Ecstasy is the antecedent for ecstasy, which, if you can get beyond the club drug references, describes a profoundly unusual state, an experience far beyond our normal sense of self, and definitely not a term traditionally associated with elite special forces. It certainly doesn't show up in the recruiting brochures. Yet everything we consider SEAL training is actually a brutal filtration system that, beyond the obvious tactical skills and physical perseverance, sorts for exclusively one thing. Does an operator, with his back against the wall, retreat into himself or merge with his team? This is why they relentlessly emphasize swim buddies in basic training. Why even on deployment in Afghanistan? Where there's not a body of water for thousands of miles, they still have swim buddies. It's also how they separate good from great in the fabled kill house, their specially designed hostage rescue training facility. Where they measure a team's ability to move as one by the millimeter, where success requires an almost superhuman collective awareness. When SEALs sweep a building, says Rich Davis, slow is dangerous. We want to move as fast as possible. To do this, there are only two rules. The first is do the exact opposite of what the guy in front of you is doing. So if he looks left, then you look right. The second is trickier. The person who knows what to do next is the leader. We're entirely non-hierarchical in that way. But in a combat environment, when split seconds make all the difference, there's no time for second guessing. When someone steps up to become the new leader, 
Everyone, immediately, automatically, moves with him. It's the only way we win. This dynamic subordination, where leadership is fluid and defined by conditions on the ground, is the foundation of flipping the switch. And even back when team leaders understood it far less than they do today. Establishing this foundation was a top priority. The Navy's caste system. 10 Team 6's colorful founder, Richard Marcinko, wrote in his autobiography, Rogue Warrior, has the reputation of being about as rigid as any in the world. To get past those divisions, Marcinko broke ranks with strict naval protocols. He had the SEALs forego standard dress codes and divisions between officers and enlisted. They wore what they wanted and rarely saluted each other. He also employed a time-tested bonding technique, getting drunk, before deployment. He'd take his team out to a local Virginia beach bar for one final bender. If there were any simmering tensions between members, they'd invariably come out after a few drinks, by morning. The men might be nursing headaches, but they'd be straight with each other and ready to function as a seamless unit. Whether it's Marcinko's ad hoc methods for flipping the switch back in the 80s, or Davis's more refined approaches today, one critical issue remains, the ability to shut off the self and merge with the team is an exceptional and peculiar talent. That's why the SEALs have spent several decades developing such a rigorous filtration process. If we really understood this phenomenon, says Davis, we could train for it, not screen for it. Unfortunately, screening is expensive and not that efficient. Nearly 80% of SEAL candidates wash out. They lose a ton of capable soldiers to the process. While it costs $500,000 to successfully train a SEAL, the cost of failure is tens of millions per year, sure. Some candidates fail to execute tactically, they shoot a cardboard hostage in the kill house or drop a weapon out of a helicopter, but far more fail to cinch up collectively. And this isn't surprising. Navigating ecstasis isn't in any field manual. It's a blank spot on their maps. Beyond the pen of most cartographers, beyond the ken of rational folk. But to the SEALs charged with capturing. Not killing, Alwazu, it wasn't beyond the ken. It was just what happened out there. And on that late September night. It happened quickly. The switch flipped as soon as we moved out, says Davis. I could feel it. But I could also see it, the invisible mechanism locking in, the group synchronizing as we patrolled, the point man looking ahead. Every man behind alternating their focus, one left, the next right, with rear security covering our six, never walking backwards. But stopping, turning, scanning, then quickening the pace to catch up with the group, before doing it again. To look at it from a distance it would seem choreographed. But it wasn't. The patrol was quick. In less than 20 minutes they reached the compound, for buildings surrounded by a high concrete wall. They stopped for a moment. Final checks, a slight reorganization, then lit out again in five groups of five. One group covered the west and north. Another the east and south, a third stayed behind to watch their backs. The final two. Groups launched the main assault. Everyone knew his job. Silence was key. Radio calls were prohibited. Talking is too slow. Says Davis. It complicates things. The assault teams were over the wall and into the buildings, blazingly fast. The first room was empty. The second was crowded and dark. There were armed guards mixed in with unarmed women and children. Under these conditions, false positives are more the rule than the exception, and knowing when not to shoot becomes the difference between a successful mission and an international incident. The conscious mind is a potent tool, but it's slow and can manage only a small amount of information at once. The subconscious, Meanwhile, is far more efficient. It can process more data in much shorter time frames. In ecstasy, the conscious mind takes a break and the subconscious takes over. As this occurs, a number of performance-enhancing neurochemicals flood the system, including norepinephrine and dopamine. Both of these chemicals amplify focus, muscle reaction times, and pattern recognition, with the subconscious in charge and those neurochemicals in play. SEALs can read micro-expressions across dark rooms at high speeds, so when a team enters hostile terrain, they can break complex threats into manageable chunks. They quickly segment the battle space into familiar situations they know how to handle, like guards that need disarming or civilians that need corralling, and unfamiliar situations, a murky shape in a far corner that may or may not be a threat, with their minds and movements tightly linked. The entire team executes simultaneously, chunking and disarming without hesitation or error. That night in Afghanistan, there was no hesitation. The SEALs cleared those rooms in moments, left a couple of men behind to watch their prisoners, then moved into the next building. That was when they spotted him. 
Alwazu was there when they entered, sitting in a chair, an Act 47 slung over his shoulder. Standard rules of engagement say an armed enemy is a dangerous enemy. But there was nothing standard about this situation. The man in front of them had escaped prison, trained other terrorists, and conducted brutal attacks. He had killed and, if given the chance, would again. But there was one small detail that every SEAL who entered the room had, in milliseconds, seen, processed, and acted upon, or, rather, not acted upon. The detail was that. At this particular moment, their target's eyes were closed. Wazoo was fast asleep. It was a bloodless capture. None wounded. None killed. Absolutely perfect. Of course. This isn't your typical war story. It's unlikely to make the news or get turned into a movie. Hollywood Studios prefers lone heroes to faceless teams, and their accounts romanticize drama and disaster. But what the SEALs accomplished on that raid comes much closer to illustrating the true core of special operations culture. At their best, they are always an anonymous team. I do not seek recognition 11 for my actions. Reads the SEAL code. I expect to lead and be led. My teammates steady my resolve and silently guide my every deed. And this ethos is reinforced every time they flip that switch when egos disappear and they perform together in ways that are just not possible alone. The hardest part of a SEAL's job is knowing when not to shoot. Awazu was hauled back to prison alive. And not one round had been fired. SEAL training is one of the most expensive filtration systems ever constructed. And it's largely designed to make ecstasy possible. So what's its real value? Well, says Davis. When we shook Wazoo awake and he saw a group of steely-eyed, black-faced Navy SEALs in his living room, the look on his face, priceless. Google goes fishing. In a high desert valley. On the other side of the world from the SEAL's Afghan hunting grounds, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, the young founders of Google, realized they needed a better filter for ecstasy themselves, and fast. It was 2001. Three years before Alwazu's rude awakening, and Page and Brin faced the biggest personnel decision of their startup lives, despite creating one of Silicon Valley's more notorious hiring gauntlets, where candidates were ruthlessly vetted for GPAs, SATs, and their ability to calculate Mensa-like brain teasers. The founders realized they couldn't crack this next hire with metrics alone. After several years of rocket ship success, Google's board had decided that the company was growing too big for Larry's and Sergey's 20-something britches. The investors felt a little adult supervision was needed and initiated a search for what would prove to be one of the more pivotal CEO hires of the high-tech era. The process wasn't easy on anyone. After nearly a year of interviews, as Bryn later told the press, Larry and I managed 12 to alienate 50 of the top executives in Silicon Valley. Time was running out. If they couldn't get it right soon, they'd prove the board's point they were in over their heads in choosing their CEO. Page and Bryn came to the conclusion that they had to look beyond their normal screening process. Resumes were all but useless. The technical part was more or less a given. There were plenty of sharp guys in the valley who could run a stable of code monkeys. But, in a town full of outsized personalities, they had to find someone who could set ego aside and get what Google was trying to do. Someone who could. In the New York Times' John Markoff's assessment, 13 disciplined Google's flamboyant, self-indulgent culture without ringing out the genius. Get it right? And they'd own the search engine space for a decade or more. Screw it up. And they could lose control of their company. Game over. Back to grad school. So, in a stroke of desperate inspiration, Page and Bryn found themselves turning to an unusual selection process, a brutal filtration system both strikingly similar to Bud, S and as wildly different as it could get. Like the SEAL's infamous Hell Week. A finalist for Google's CEO job would have to spend five nearly sleepless days and nights enduring oppressive sun, freezing cold, and a 24-7 barrage of VUCA conditions, pushed to physical and psychological extremes. The prospective leader would have nowhere to hide. Would he retreat into himself? Or could he merge with the team? Of course, there were a few differences, unlike the San Diego beach where Bud S. prospects proved themselves, the beach page and Brin had in mind hadn't seen flowing water in nearly 15,000 years. It was now a bone-dry lake bed in the middle of Nevada's Black Rock Mountains, the site of Burning Man, one of the stranger rites of passage in modern times. And rite of passage is the right phrase. This teeming, Temporary carnival of tens of thousands has its own quirky customs, exotic rituals, and a fiercely dedicated following. It's a modern-day elusis. A bacchanalian blowout, the party at the end of time, take your pick. But there's no denying the truth. Something happens out there. And Page and Bryn were regular and enthusiastic attendees. The company. 
that set the bar 14 for catered perks ran free shuttle buses to the event for many years. The two-story atrium of Building 43, Google's main headquarters, wasn't decorated with industry accolades or stock ticker flat screens. Instead, it showcased pictures of loincloth wearing, fire-spinning Googlers and their eclectic Burning Man art projects. In fact, the very first Google Doodle, posted in the late summer of 1998, was a crude stick figure of the Burning Man himself, made from Takamas set back to back. Centered over the second yellow O in Google, that cryptic icon signified to those in the know that Page and Bryn were turning out the lights in Palo Alto and lighting out for the Nevada Badlands. Uptime be damned. So, when the founders heard that Eric Schmidt, the 46-year-old veteran of Sun Microsystems and a Berkeley PhD computer scientist, was the sole CEO finalist who had already been to the event. They rejiggered their rankings and gave the guy a callback. Eric was the only one 15 who went to Burning Man. Bryn told Doc Searles, then a Berkman Center fellow at Harvard. We thought was an important criterion. Stanford sociologist Fred Turner 16 agrees. Arguing that the festival's appeal to Silicon Valley is that it brings that hive mind experience to the masses, transforms the work of engineering into a kind of communal vocational ecstasy. One of Turner's research subjects, a Googler himself, explained his experience on a pyrotechnic team, very focused, very few words, open to anything. We worked very tightly I loved the feeling of flow on the team. It was an extended ecstatic feeling of interpersonal unity and timelessness we shared throughout, and like the SEALs flipping the switch. The Googler's communal vocational ecstasy relies on changes in brain function, attending festivals like Burning Man. 17 explains Oxford professor of neuropsychology Molly Crockett, practicing meditation, being in flow, or taking psychedelic drugs rely on shared neural substrates. What many of these roots have in common is activation of the serotonin system. But it's not only serotonin that makes up the foundation of those collaborative experiences. In those states, all of the neurochemicals 18 that can arise, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, endorphins, anandamide, and oxytocin, play roles in social bonding. Norepinephrine and dopamine typically underpin romantic love. Endorphins and oxytocin link mother to child and friend to friend, anandamide and serotonin deepen feelings of trust, openness, and intimacy. When combinations of these chemicals flow through groups at once, you get tighter bonds and heightened cooperation. That heightened cooperation, that communal vocational ecstasy, was what Page, Bryn, and so many of Google's engineers had discovered in the desert. It was an altered state of consciousness that suggested a better way of working together and a feeling that anyone who presumed to lid them simply had to know firsthand. Maybe. If Schmidt could endure the blistering heat, the dust storms, the sleepless nights, and the relentless don't-give-a-shit-who-you-are strangeness of Burning Man, just maybe, he'd be the guy who could help them grow the dream without killing it. Did it work? Did a bash in the boonies filter for critical talent better than any algorithm they could code? The whole point of taking Schmidt to Burning Man. 19 explains Salim Ismail, global ambassador for Singularity University and a Silicon Valley fixture, was to see how he could handle a wild environment. Could he deal with the volatile? Novel context. The extreme creativity. Did he merge with his team or stand in their way? And that's what they learned on that trip. That's one of Schmidt's great talents. He's really flexible. Even in difficult conditions, he adapted his management style to fit their culture without bleeding out their genius and turned Google into a monster success. Just check the numbers. When Google hired Schmidt 20 in 2001, their revenues were rumored to be about $100 million. A decade later, when Schmidt finally handed the CEO reins back to Page, the company's revenues were nearly $40 billion. That's a return of almost 40,000%. Page and Bryn have gone on to become numbers 9 and 10 on Forbes's list of the world's wealthiest individuals. While Schmidt is one of the only non-founder, non-family members to ever become a stock option billionaire in history, even for a company like Google. Dedicated to unassuming goals like 10x moonshots and organizing the entire world's information, a 400x return. As close to priceless as they'll ever get. Hacking ecstasy. What's really going on here? Why did Google and the Navy SEALs, two of the highest performing organizations in the world, have to resort to makeshift filters to find the next level skills they desperately needed? After all, Page and Bryn were two of the smarter PhD students to come through Stanford in years. The team they gathered at Google was handpicked for its ability to quantify the inscrutable, even back in 2001. The company was awash in cash. If there was a way to build or buy a better talent mousetrap, they would have used it to find their next CEO, DEVG or you. Meanwhile, has a blank check to pursue the cutting edge. 
and ammunition alone. Annually, these guys spend as much as the entire U.S. Marine Corps. So for them to acknowledge, as Commander Rich Davis did, that an altered state of consciousness was both essential to mission success and elusive as hell. Something they had to screen for by attrition, but couldn't train for by design. That doesn't make a lot of sense. That's because, any way you slice it, ecstasy doesn't make a lot of sense. It remains a profound experience. A place far beyond our normal selves, what author Arthur C. Clarke called a sufficiently advanced technology, the kind that still looks like magic to us. In light of this, it's easy to see why Google built their talent map around the reliable and observable, grade point averages, standardized tests, and IQ scores. It's what engineers know. It's how they think. SEALs, too, are famously empirical. If it doesn't work first time, every time, they find something better that will. And theirs is a macho culture where feelings get short shrift. So a feeling like ecstasy. No one's going to touch that one. Not, at least, until DARPA builds an implant for it. So, 10 years ago. This is where we found Google and the SEALs, to high-performing organizations hunting an odd set of skills that neither of them could name or train. And it's not that they were looking in the wrong place. They were just a little ahead of the curve. Over the past 10 years, science and technology have come round that bend. Empirical evidence has started to replace trial and error. And this is giving us new ways to approach ecstasy. But, before we dive into some of those stories, we first need to define our terms. When we say ecstasy, we're talking about a very specific range of non-ordinary states of consciousness 21. What Johns Hopkins, psychiatrist Stanislav Grof defined as those experiences characterized by dramatic perceptual changes, intense and often unusual emotions, profound alterations in the thought processes and behavior, by a variety of psychosomatic manifestations, rang from profound terror to ecstatic rapture. There exist many different forms of NOSC. They can be induced by a variety of different techniques or occur spontaneously in the middle of everyday life. Out of this broader inventory, we focused on three specific categories. First, flow states. Those in the zone moments including group flow or what the SEALs experienced during the capture of al Wazu and the Googlers harnessed in the desert. Second, contemplative and mystical states. Where techniques like chanting, dance, meditation, sexuality, and most recently, wearable technologies are used to shut off the self. Finally, psychedelic states, where the recent resurgence in sanctioned research is leading to some of the more intriguing pharmacological findings in several decades. Taken together, these three categories define our territory of ecstasy. Admittedly, these three may seem like strange bedfellows, and for most of the past hundred years, we've treated them that way. Flow states have been typically associated with artists. And athletes, contemplative and mystical states belong to seekers and saints, and psychedelic states were mostly sampled by hippies and ravers. But over the past decade, thanks to advances in brain science, we've been able to pull back the curtain and discover that these seemingly unrelated phenomena share remarkable neurobiological similarities. Regular waking consciousness has a predictable and consistent signature 22 in the brain. Widespread activity in the prefrontal cortex, brain waves in the high-frequency beta range, and the steady drip, drip of stress chemicals like norepinephrine and cortisol, during the states we're describing. 23 This signature shifts markedly. Instead of widespread activity in the prefrontal cortex, we see specific parts of this region either light up and become hyperactive or power down and become hypoactive. At the same time, brain waves slow from agitated beta to daydreamy alpha and deeper theta. Neurochemically, Stress chemicals like norepinephrine and cortisol are replaced by performance-enhancing, pleasure-producing compounds such as dopamine, endorphins, anandamide, serotonin, and oxytocin. So no matter how varied these states appear on the surface, their underlying neurobiological mechanisms, that is, the knobs and levers being tweaked in the brain 24, are the same. And this understanding allows us to tune altered states with newfound precision. Consider one of the simplest and oldest ecstatic techniques. Meditation, historically. If you wanted to use meditation to consistently produce a state where the self vanished, decades of practice were required. Why? Because your target was nothing more than a peculiar sensation. And hitting it was like throwing darts blindfolded. But researchers now know that the center of that target actually correlates to changes in brain function. Like brain waves in the low alpha, high theta range, and this unlocks all kinds of new training options. Instead of following the breath, Meditators can be hooked up to neurofeedback devices that steer the brain directly toward that alpha, theta range. It's a fairly straightforward adjustment to electrical activity. 
but it can accelerate learning, letting practitioners achieve in months what used to take years. For organizations like the SEALs and Google, these developments are allowing them to take an entirely different approach to high performance. They've moved beyond their earlier explorations and are now pursuing ecstasy with a degree of precision that was simply not possible even 10 years ago. The Mind Gym In the summer of 2013, we got a chance to meet with both the SEALs and Google and see for ourselves how far they've come. We visited the SEALs because Rich Davis and several of DEVGRU's team leaders had read The Rise of Superman and noticed a considerable overlap between the flow described in the book and their own experiences on the battlefield. For Davis, that al Wazu raid was only one of dozens of missions where he'd found himself in the zone, doing the impossible. These moments changed his life. He began hunting for experts who could tell him how these states worked and how to get more of them. Would have anything new to teach these guys? We got an invitation to the SEAL's Norfolk, Virginia, headquarters to observe the men in action and offer any insights we had on flipping the switch. After wading through several layers of background checks and Byzantine paperwork, we spent a morning presenting to the teams and a few hours watching live fire, hostage rescue training from an observation deck in the rafters of the kill house. Then, during the debrief, we found ourselves sitting in a windowless conference room talking to team leaders about the high cost of screening for ecstasy. The issue wasn't just financial. The $500,000 it took to train a SEAL. The $4.25 million it cost to get them to DEVGRU, even the tens of millions wasted along the way, what concerned them more was the human cost, again and again. We heard how emotionally devastating their screening process can be, how failure ruins careers and lives. We're a very high-performing club. 25 explain one SEAL team leader, and some guys can't bounce back from failure. When that meeting was over, they walked us through their newest facility, the Mind Gym, which was their best guess at how to train for ecstasy and not just screen for it. Sure, it cost millions to build. But if it could help them flip that switch reliably, if it could help more good men learn this invisible skill, it would be worth much more than that. Equal parts CrossFit sweat. In DARPA Wizardry, the Mind Gym is a collection of some of the best tools and tech for training body-brain performance in the world, EEG brain monitors, medical-grade cardiac coherence devices, motion tracking fitness stations, all kitted out with sensors, scanners, and screens designed to drive the SEALs into the zone faster than ever. As we rounded one corner in the facility, we spotted for egg-shaped pods in a small alcove. They were sensory deprivation tanks, where users float in salt water in pitch blackness for hours at a time. Invented by National Institutes of Health researcher and neuroscientist John Lilly 26 in the 1960s, these tanks were specifically designed to help people shut off the self. After Lilly began using these tanks to explore the effects of LSD and ketamine on consciousness, they fell out of favor with the establishment and devolved into a countercultural curiosity. But here they were again, in the red-hot center of the military-industrial complex, being used to train super soldiers. And the SEALs have been iterating on Lilly's original technology, working with researchers at Advanced Brain Monitoring. In Carlsbad, California, they've hotwired neural and cardiac feedback loops, digital displays, and high-fidelity sound into the experience. They're deploying these upgrades for a practical purpose. Accelerated learning. By using the tanks to eliminate all distraction, in train specific brainwaves and regulate heart rate frequency, the SEALs are able to cut the time it takes to learn a foreign language from six months to six weeks for a specialized unit deployed across five continents. Shutting off the self to accelerate learning has become a strategic imperative. It's not just the Navy that is studying this domain in more depth. A few months after our visit to Norfolk, we crossed the country for a trip to the Googleplex. We were there to talk flow states with engineers and learn more about what the company is doing to harness the communal vocational ecstasy they'd first glimpsed at Burning Man in the Black Rock Desert of Nevada. Right after our presentation, we pedaled a couple of the ubiquitous and colorful Google bikes to the other side of campus to attend the opening of their new multi-million dollar mindfulness center. Outfitted in soothing lime green with bamboo accents, the center features a vitality bar offering fresh squeezed juices around the clock and a suite of meditation rooms decked out with sensor suits and neurofeedback devices similar to what we saw in the Navy's mind gym. Google had realized that when it comes to the highly competitive tech marketplace, helping engineers get into the zone and stay there longer was an essential investment. But like the SEALs, they hadn't completely ironed out all the variables. It's going well. 27 explained Adam Leonard, one of the leaders of GPOS. We've got active communities around the world. But the bigger challenge is getting people who aren't already meditators to start. 
The folks that already sit understand the benefits. It's the ones that are too busy and distressed to slow down and need it the most that are the hardest to reach. Not for lack of trying, though. In talking to Google's human performance team, we learned that many of the company's legendary efforts to create a seamless live work environment, from Wi-Fi-enabled commuter shuttles to farm-to-table dining rooms to pre-booked tickets for weekend adventures, were also attempts to minimize interruptions and keep employees in flow, unlike those of many other firms. 28 Stanford's Fred Turner points out, Google's managers have subsidized the explorations of its engineers and administrators and have promulgated relentlessly an ethos of benevolent peer production. By doing everything possible to keep people out of their heads and absorbed in their projects, Google is trying to make that same vocational ecstasy they found in the desert a permanent part of their on-campus lives. The altered state's economy, after those visits, and seeing how much time and money these two organizations were willing to put into maximizing the benefits of altered states, we couldn't help but wonder about the rest of us. Was it possible that deliberately seeking ecstasy went beyond high-performing organizations? Did any of this matter to regular folks? And if so, how much? Tell me what you value and I might believe you. Management guru Peter Drucker once said, but show me your calendar and your bank statement, and I'll show you what you really value. So we decided to take Drucker's advice and follow the money. First, we dubbed the amount of cash and coin people spend each year trying to get out of their heads the altered state's economy 29 and we didn't mean this metaphorically, we meant it literally. Getting out of our heads requires a precise biological signature in the brain, specifically. A slowdown in neuroelectrical activity, a deactivation of the network that supports self-consciousness, and the presence of at least a couple of the big six neurochemicals we mentioned earlier. If an experience produces this signature, then we could credibly include it in our tally. With neurobiology as our filter, we were able to spot similarities between otherwise disparate experiences. By paying attention to a singular category, like flow states or contemplative states or psychedelic states, it would have been easy to miss the larger trend and deeper patterns. But, with the knobs and levers serving as a Rosetta Stone for non-ordinary consciousness, we could decode commonalities and measure impact in ways that were simply impossible before. In other words, we could start to put some hard numbers around the altered state's economy. Now, to be clear, we are not implying that all of the categories we are about to consider reflect deliberate, healthy, or intentional approaches to cultivating ecstasy. In fact, many are the exact opposite, impulsive, destructive, and unintentional. But that very fact, that we are driven to pursue altered states often at a steep cost, underscores how large and sometimes hidden a role they play in our lives. We began our tally with the fairly uncontroversial assumption that any accounting of ecstasy should include all the substances people use to change states. From alcohol, tobacco, and caffeine on the licit side to cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamines on the illicit side. We also included the legal and illegal markets for marijuana, psychopharmaceuticals like Ritalin and Adderall, and mood-shifting painkillers like Oxycontin and Vicodin. Next, we widened the net beyond substances that change our state of mind to experiences that do the same. We assessed therapeutic and personal development programs designed to get me out of my head and help me feel happier, from psychological and psychiatric counseling to the massive online self-help market. We also considered a wide range of high-flow pursuits like action sports, video games, and gambling, that is, activities that are primarily engaged for intrinsic reward, rather than external recognition. Then we took a conservative approach to the broader categories of media and entertainment. While one could argue, for example, that much of the live music industry reflects a desire for state-changing collective experience, we zeroed in on an ascendant and uniquely qualified genre, electronic dance music, an EDM. Leading DJs earn eight figures a year for showing up in a club and pressing play on a laptop. So it's not about the appeal of the band. There isn't one. And it's not about the lyrics. Either. There aren't any. What is it about? Thunderous bass. Tightly synchronized light shows, and, typically, lots of mind-altering substances. Other than the state shift it produces, there is little reason to seek out the experience. And those states have become increasingly popular. In 2014, EDM represented almost half of all concert sales, attracting a quarter of a million concertgoers at a time and drawing the attention of Wall Street investors and major private equity firms. We were equally focused in our assessment of film and TV. Narrowing our accounting to genres that are especially immersive and escapist, like IMAX divided by 3D films and streaming pornography. In the case of IMAX. For instance, why go to see these movies at all? In a few months. We could catch the identical film in the comfort of our homes. Instead, 
We drive to faraway theaters and pay a premium for total immersion, surround sound that shakes our seats, 40-foot screens that swallow our vision, and the company of others who gasp, boo, and clap alongside us. We don't pay extra to see more. We pay it to feel more and think less. And then there's pornography. Given that 7 of the top 20 most visited sites on the web are porn sites, and that nearly 33% of all internet searches are for terms related to sex, it's safe to say that we're sinking a ton of time and money into digital voyeurism. Unlike analog sex, viewing porn has no evolutionary payoff. So why do so many do it so often? Because, for a brief moment, we lose ourselves in a state of physiological arousal and neurochemical saturation. Put bluntly, we watch porn to get high, not to get laid. We ended our study with what many of us know best these days. Social media. What makes these online distractions so sticky is how effectively they prime our brains for reward. Stanford neuroscientist Robert Sapolsky calls this priming the magic of maybe. When we check our email or Facebook or Twitter, and sometimes we find a response and sometimes we don't. The next time a friend connects, Sapolsky discovered that we enjoy a 400% spike in dopamine. This can become distracting to the point of addicting. In 2016, the business consultancy Deloitte found that Americans are looking at their phones more than 8 billion times a day, in a world where 67% of us admit to checking our status updates in the middle of the night, during sex, and before attending to basic biological needs like going to the bathroom, sleeping, or eating breakfast. We think it's safe to assume that a good part of what we're habitually doing online is more to forget ourselves for a moment than inform ourselves for the long haul, category by category. We followed Drucker's advice, seeing what our calendars and our bank accounts said about how much we really value stepping outside ourselves, and what we found was staggering. See in notes for a detailed workup of these numbers and wu.stealingfireboook.com slash download slash for a worksheet where you can calculate your own personal tally. Add it all together. The altered state's economy totals out to roughly for trillion dollars a year. That's a sizable chunk of our income that we annually tie to the Church of the Ecstatic. We spend more on this than we do on maternity care, humanitarian aid, and K-12 education combined. It's larger than the gross national product of Britain, India, or Russia. And to really put this in perspective, it's twice as many dollars as there are known galaxies in the entire universe 30 so even though much of our seeking is haphazard and often counterproductive, this for trillion dollars total stands as a pretty good metric for how badly we want to get out of our heads and how much we're willing to spend for even a shot at relief. Yet this raises a few additional questions. If we're already spending a ton of time and money chasing these states, and even elite organizations like the SEALs and Google haven't definitively cracked the code, could something so elusive and confounding be worth all that trouble? Can these experiences provide benefits we can't get any other way? Put simply, are they worth it?